good morning and um, welcome everybody to our webinar today, Working with Broadcasters, How Arts Content Gets Onto TV and Radio and the webinars presented by The Space. I'm Linda Coburn, I'm the moderator today. Um, I'm a middle-aged white woman wearing glasses and a large purple jumper. And I'll start by giving a bit of practical information about how we'll work. So three things to note, we have a live captioner with us. And if you would like captions, the information about how to access them has just gone into the chat. Um, we use chat a lot throughout the webinar uh, for exchanging ideas and views and also for asking questions of the panelists, uh, which all happens that way. So please familiarize yourself with chat and the people who are already in it. And thirdly, to note that the webinar is going to be recorded and will be available on our YouTube channel for a period of up to a year after the webinar takes place. And if you have any questions about how we work or anything that you want to know, please just put it into chat and one of our team will be able to help you. Um, and so before I get into the detail of what we'll cover today, let's just introduce the space as an organisation. Can we have a look at the slide, please? Um, so we are um, the UK's Digital Commissioning and Development Agency, as you can see from the slide, and we've worked with lots and lots of different organisations and different aspects of arts and culture. And we've supported and co-commissioned a wide range of radio and TV programmes, which range from the very high end multi-camera captures to um, documentary formats and everything in between. And that's really what we're drawing on today. We're looking at three particular case studies. So we'll just share the timetable slide. And this is, this is how we're going to work. So you, you'll hear from, um, I'll introduce the panelists in a minute, but you'll hear from th three, three different case studies looking at really different perspective on um, how work happens in TV and radio. Um, and as you see, we'll have a little break in the minute, a bit of a screen break for everybody. And um, what the slide doesn't say is that we have masses of opportunity for you to ask questions again through chat, but in between each of these sections, and then we'll ask all the panel to come back together um, after we've heard from everybody. Um, to, for, for sort of general conversations, and we've had some questions from you in advance, and we'll include all of those as we go along. Um, so of the three case studies, one, the, the um, Sky Arts programme is really an, an emerging talent programme, so an opportunity for new and emerging artists to, to work in TV. One was a radio co-commission, that's Metal City, and Rosie will talk more broadly about mm -hmm. other co-commissions that she's worked on as well. And, um, and then finally, we'll hear from, from Helen Shute and Sarah Butcher about the, um, the way that they have put together the Peaky Blinders Womba Dance for BBC Four. Um, and really today what we're looking at is how arts gets onto TV and radio, how the process works from the initial interest to production and who's involved and, and what we, they do. Um, and we know that it's a huge subject. Um, and so just to flag that we aren't, haven't got time to cover everything. And so during the webinar, we'll be putting links into the chat um, to previous webinars and other resources and ideas for where you might go for more information. For example, we're not talking about pitching in any kind of detail. I know that people have asked questions about that in advance, but we'll put all the resources that we have into the links and that will be helpful to you. Okay, so what I'll do now is invite the panel. So Seema and Rosie, um, Natalie, Natalie and uh, Sarah and Helen, would you like to put your cameras on? And I'll come to you one by one and ask you to introduce yourself, describe yourself, and then, uh, and then we'll hear from everybody. So um, Sarah, would you like to start? Would you just tell us, would you describe yourself and tell us who you are and what your role is? Hi everyone, I'm Sarah Butcher. I'm a white woman with blonde hair up in a bun and I'm wearing a grey scarf today because it's rather chilly. Um, I'm co-creative director of a production company called North South who specialise in stage to screen content for broadcast and cinema. Thank you very much. And Helen, you'll be joining Sarah to talk about Peaky. So would you like to introduce yourself please and describe yourself? 
Yes, hi everyone. My name's Helen Shute. I'm also a white woman, mid-length brown hair, dark brown eyes, and also wearing a big roll neck jumper. I'm, but I'm boiling, so I'll be sweating by the end of this, this webinar. Um, I'm the chief executive and executive producer of Rombeth. Thank you. Thanks, Helen. And Seema, would you like to introduce yourself and describe yourself? Hi, I'm Seema Gonsai. I'm an Indian lady with mid-length brown hair wearing a black and white cardigan. Um, I'm a freelance director, producer and programmer, film festival programmer, and I specialise in visual arts, dance and narrative short film. Thank you very much. And Rosie, would you like to introduce yourself? Yes, hello, I'm Rosie. I'm a middle-aged white woman with um, mid-length blonde hair and glasses sitting in what looks like an alarmingly pink um, spare bedroom, which is where I do all my work, uh, like all good radio freelancers. And I make um, radio programmes for Radio 3, 4 and the World Service, uh, along with a, a small team in the town. Thank you. Thanks very much. So I've asked all the panellists to introduce themselves to you, the audience, so that you know who, who to, you expect to hear from later on through the session. But if you would like to turn your cameras off and relax now, I'm going to go to Natalie next and then she'll talk and then I'll bring you back in, Seema, when we've heard from Natalie. So Natalie, would you like to do the same and then we'll kick off from that point? Yeah. Hi, I'm Natalie. I'm a commissioning editor at The Space and I look after our broadcast and video projects as well as our online resources. I'm a white woman with dark brown hair wearing a blue shirt and a green cardigan. Thank you very much. Thanks. So Natalie, we'll start off really with a bit of a, a space perspective on this. And as you know, you're an executive producer for The Space. You work on a whole range of broadcast projects and often you work in with arts organisations who might not have done this before, been involved in a broadcast production. What are the key points that you think we want to get across in this webinar? Yeah, so firstly I'm keen to acknowledge that many artists and cultural organisations really want to see or hear their work on TV or radio um, and this is often for a wide variety of reasons including um, increased profile and especially connecting with a bigger and broader audience through those through those channels. Um, but we understand that what it actually means to work with a broadcaster can be quite opaque from the outside. So today we're really keen to demystify the process um, a bit as to how it all works. And as you've just heard, we've got teams from several great projects that we've done recently um, to describe how it worked for them. The second thing I would say, and apologies if I'm stating the obvious for anyone, is that if your project is commissioned for TV or radio, it doesn't mean that a broadcaster will is going to come to you and make it for you. Um, arts programming is not like news where a cameraman and a producer will sort of turn up and kind of cover your piece of work and film or record what you're making. You'll need a producer backed up by a company to put together the idea with you, and make it happen in partnership with you. That could be an in-house producer at a major broadcaster, or it could be a producer through an independent production company. And um, that relationship is the key one um, because that producer will become your key creative partner and li the liaison point and sometimes translator between you and the broadcaster and um, helping you jump all the hurdles that are required for a broadcast asset um, and helping you to know what's required at each stage in the process. Um, and sort of linked to that, the final thing um, I hope everyone will take away today is that collaboration and partnership it's just really fundamental um, to get your broadcast project across the line. Um, as I've just mentioned, you'll need an experienced TV or radio producer or executive producer to make your work with you for broadcast and finding the right person for that, for whom you feel really understands what your project is about and what you're trying to achieve um, is absolutely crucial. But we'll hear more about that, that role, that producer role as the session goes on. Yeah, I think we'll it'll be echoed in all of the talks really is that the thing about the collaboration and the and the people that are involved thank you so um broadcasting is um an environment with its own very sort of unique set of requirements what might be new to an arts organization in all of this if they were making a, a something for broadcast commission 
Yeah, so it's important to say from the off that broadcast is a very different landscape from the arts. And it's just good to just say that up front. Um, creatively, like any art form, um, there's a creative grammar to TV and radio projects that generally needs to be um, known and adhered to to help the audience navigate their way through a piece of work. That's certain ways of introducing things or cutting between shots and voices, certain, you know, lineup of shots in a, in a TV film um, that are part of what an audience expect. Um, and that's why that collaboration, this is the first time I'm going to keep going back to it, um, with, is really important um, with a producer or director um, because they will help translate your vision, what you've created um, on stage or in a gallery space um, to that new broadcast medium. The other thing, um, maybe less creative that's worth mentioning is that broadcast platforms are highly regulated um, by Ofcom and that's important to note as well because it means that there are requirements for TV and radio that don't exist for most artworks. These include technical requirements about sound and video quality and what's called compliance considerations which are about sensitive content like swearing, violence, nudity, politics, this kind of long list. Um, and rather a lot of paperwork to do. Um, and again, that's where your experienced producer comes in because there's no reason that you should necessarily know what those um, requirements or limitations or considerations are, um, but you'll need to know them at every stage of the process to make sure that your project will fit what's needed for the broadcaster. Um, and the final thing I would say um, is again, sometimes unlike the arts where a writer or director's vision can sometimes shape the whole, every detail of a whole project, in broadcast um, projects pass through a lot of hands um, and you should be prepared for a level of input or interference, depending how you want to look at it, um, that you may, might not be used to from um, an art sphere. Um, so to give you a sense of that, a broadcast commissioner will expect to see a detailed treatment or script for a project ahead of agreeing to it in the first place. You'll need to do what's called an editorial specification, giving a really detailed overview of every aspect of the project um, before it's committed to you. And the commissioner will see or hear cuts of your project, you know, what's called a rough cut, a fine cut, sort of it in draft form um, several times before the piece is aired. They'll give feedback at every stage of that, and, and that feedback needs to be adhered to because the broadcaster has final, any broadcaster has final editorial control on everything on their channels. So it really is collaboration at every stage. And I would say bringing in whoever that commission, whoever you're contacting is at the broadcaster early on to your vision, how exciting, dynamic, artistic, whatever it is you want to convey from the early stage with your pitch materials and your treatment is really crucial and keeping that dialogue open throughout because there will be quite a lot of back and forth. Thank you. So the space works with broadcasters who commission in a variety of ways and the space's role in it is also is, it, it, it sometimes as a co-commissioner and sometimes as a co-producer. And um, so it's, it, every project is different. But, um, and one of the, the first one that we're going to talk about um, is we're going to hear from Seema in a minute talking about um, the Sky Arts Unlocked series. Um, but Seema's talking about her work in it. So before she starts, could you just give us a bit of an explainer about what the project was from a space point of view? Yeah, of course. Yes, yeah. so Unlocked was a project we ran in 2021 into 2022 um, with a number of partners, Sky Arts, Coventry, City of Culture and Shoot Festival. Um, we put a call out to an open call out to creatives in the Coventry area and um, in the Coventry City of Culture year um, to put forward an idea for a short film to be broadcast on Sky Arts that responded creatively to the provocation unlocked what does it mean to be free which tied in with um, one of the city of culture themes that year which was around freedom and um, together the partners commissioned 10 films out of those um 10 films from those applications each of those um individual artists some teams some individuals were given seven thousand five hundred pounds to make their short and the final group 
they're a really stunning mix of drama, dance, documentary, spoken word, lots of different things on show. Um, and I think we've got a trailer to, that we can show before Seema goes into more detail. Thank you, Natalie. Thank you. And I'll get Seema on. Great, thank you. So that's the that was the trailer for the whole series. And now um, I'm going to ask Seema to join me. We'll find out more about her role in in the uh, Unlocked series. Thank you. Hello, Seema. Hello again. Hello. Um, I wanted to start by explaining that you were headhunted by the space to be the exec producer on two of the Sky Arts Unlocked films. And we're going to get to those in a while, but your journey to that point is really interesting. So I wondered if you could give us an overview of your background, your experience, and how you got to the point of execing these two films. Yeah, great. I mean, I'm just recovering from a bit of a sore throat. So I might, if I, if I turn my sound off, it's just a cough. <laughs> so I'll be back. Uh, yeah, so I, I did the kind of usual um, thing of studying film in several kind of universities uh, many years ago. I don't want to reveal my age, but it was a long time ago and I went to several places. And my goal was always to make film uh, or be in broadcast. Um, but as I was kind of venturing through the various different courses, realized that that wasn't really something that was an opportunity for me. Um, so I became, I was very, very interested in visual arts uh, my, my background was within dance. So I kind of started to make films, short films that looked at those different genres. Um, the themes of my work were very much around diversity, um, multi-generational stories from all across the world. I traveled a lot across the world and I made lots of very short films looking at those different communities from the different countries that I went to. So I guess my, my kind of dipping into film was making short films and, and venturing into indie um, and so I made short films that were dance films where dance and film come together. I also worked a lot in narrative um, with independent short films that all went across to film festivals um, and then my visual arts was more gallery based so huge installation based work uh, but all of it was always film, all of it was always about storytelling um, and finding different ways of presenting stories on screen. Yeah, so there's storytelling being key to, to all of this. And, and then, and so you said, so you've, you've, you've made lots of short films um, and pr presented them at film festivals and so on <laughs> along the way and were very successful at getting funding, which we haven't time to get into, but there's a, there's a real sort of a route here, isn't there, about saying, you know, building up your skills and getting more and more experience. Um, how did that background help you to work on this on, on the Sky Arts, the Unlocked films? So I think one of the greatest things was when you make a short film, um, it was really the success of sending those films to film festivals. Uh, and I was venturing more and more into narrative, um, storytelling by using narrative. So I'd made quite a lot of documentaries, short documentaries, and quite a lot of dance films. And so, yeah, I think the space kind of could see the type of work that I was making, the different people that I was working with. I was very much kind of steeped within the West Midlands film industry. Um, I worked with lots of different filmmakers within the region. So yeah, we got to, the, we, I guess, yeah, the Sky Arts kind of came, not Sky Arts, but the space came to me, um, I guess, with that knowledge. And then, yeah, I mean, I had a lot of experience working not really within broadcast as much, but very much within storytelling, within drama, dance, and and visual arts. Yeah. 
So do you want to tell us a bit about one? Of, you, you might want to focus on one or the other, but just tell us about the two, the two films that you were involved in and what was your role in that? So yeah, so the two films that I was involved in was Davey and also Sent to Cobb. So yeah, I guess what my experience in working with those two particular projects was, was, was that because I've worked so much within the arts, I'm able to translate artistic and theatre and dance projects into film, which is like a really, really big stepping stone actually between going from one to the other, being able to interpret that. So I worked alongside two directors and scriptwriters who were very used to making work for the stage, uh, very successful in doing that, touring their work all across the UK, we're looking at various different sort of themed work of diversity and cultural heritage. Um, and we kind of went through the whole process of like, well, how do you as a theatre director and writer now interpret your stories and your storytelling style into film and into broadcast TV. So the journey itself was really from very much the starting point of the treatment. Um, the directors realizing that, okay, we usually write, you know, scripts that are lengthy scripts for a 40 minute or a 50 minute um, play or 30 theatre production. Now it's like, how can you condense that down to a short film? So that particular journey began with the treatment. From that treatment stage, we then had a fantastic script editor, which I have to say I learned a lot from, and many of the other producers that were Zet producers that were on, on the whole Unlocked series also learned um, quite a lot from having a, a dedicated script editor who could work with the directors um, with their scripts once your treatment had been kind of signed off, that you then write a script. And so those scripts, you know, if you're writing something that's a lot shorter than what you're used to, and it, you know, it often has a beginning, middle, and end, which is what we're used to on on film, on TV. Um, we had to consider the audience. Who are the audience? Why are they watching this? Why would they want to watch it? Um, who is the audience that you're reaching out to? So your script, and you know, and what is the story that you're telling? You know, is it extraordinary? Is it original? Um, what perspective is it? How many characters do you have? It's all of those sorts of things that have to be considered to the script point. I think once you've got your script signed up um, and you feel like it's a really powerful story, then the rest kind of falls into place. Um, both films had teams that they wanted to work with, production crew that they wanted to work with. We kind of oversaw how they worked, looking at the production schedules, how many days it would need to actually make the film, budgeting the project really really to the point you know not going over budget understanding how you budget a short film with all the crew that you would need um you know not not a one man does it all type thing one man band type thing um so that that understanding as well and then we get to the edit stage where you know the space and all of the compliance and all of that has to be considered as well so it's quite it's quite a different journey for if you're making something for stage to if you're making something for screen. Mm. And what and what about for you? Was there anything about the process that really surprised you or you thought it was very interesting? I think one of the key things, what I said before, was that working with, with a script editor who only writes scripts for TV. So if you come from an artistic background, whether you're dance, or theater, music, um, any of those backgrounds, you you are used to writing for the audience that come to see your work, you know, but, and, and audiences come to see your work because they know you and they know the actors, they know who's in it, you know, you have a big following. But the minute you go into TV, you know, straight away, no one, you're unknown. So you, your, your audience is completely new. They don't know you, they don't know your actors. So you need a script editor kind of to look at what you're writing with fresh eyes. And with a knowledge that this is what works in TV. Mm. Um, I think one of the greatest things was less is more. We're used to writing with several characters, uh, having dynamic stories within, within, you know, a 40 minute play, for example, then thinking you could squeeze that 40 minutes into a 10, but that's not really possible. You know, you really have to look at a script editor for me was, was having, was, was making, was, was great for me to understand relationships between 
um, the message, A, the message of the story, and B, then relationships between your characters or your dancers or the music. What is it are you trying to say? So that was that was a, a, a fantastic um, thing for for me to work with. Yeah. Because can I ask you? You know, it's one of the things we'll sort of pick into is why. Why would any why would an arts organisation go down this route and thinking about what what you get from it apart from an audience potentially? Uh, did, have you taken any of that the new knowledge back into your other work? So you're talking about the script editor. Has any of it informed what you, what you do in your own work? Absolutely, yeah. I mean, like a script editor is is obviously for both broadcast and TV. And one of the things that I would say is to always have an understanding of what's being made and where it's going because we're in such a change in landscape right now broadcast is one platform but then digital and online there are several platforms on there so it's having an understanding of okay i want to make a piece of work that is for stage uh, but actually now i need to be writing something completely different for broadcast something completely different for for example uh, an online um, tv channel you know that's very different to what you'd find on the broadcast tv channel so so i i've kind of started to kind of investigate you know what are people watching how are they watching it what sort of content are they taking on board um and then therefore kind of designing projects and designing work for those different platforms so you're sort of thinking widely about where where is why where might this all go and where are, where are the opportunities for my work more generally? Yeah, and keeping your storytelling at the core. So whatever you're passionate about and what it is that you want to write about and what it is you want to make, that is always at the core of it. The originality of that, you know, your uniqueness comes into that. But it's like I'm having an understanding of now in today's technology technology age, kind of like where do you need to be showing this work and how are you going to do that so having some sort of professional like a script editor that we had for a broadcast you know the equivalent the equivalent of that for other platforms as well thank you i'm just going to say to the audience if anybody's got a particular question because there's lots about your what you're saying that's really really interesting if anybody's got a particular question for seema will you put it into the chat and i'll pose the questions to seema um, as we go along um, and I just wanted to go back to what N N Natalie was saying about there being many hands on a project and and the and, and and the broadcaster having the ultimate control of what goes out and I wondered whether for for you and the and the and the the, the artists that you worked with was that quite tricky you know because you're obviously so in, in control of your own work it, it, normally how, how does that feel to have to sort of relinquish the control or is it a good thing? Is there anything that you would say about that, about the, what the, that, that relationship? So I think, I think as Natalie said, you know, um, you would be the scriptwriter or director or both. Uh, and then you would need to find, you need to collaborate with a team of people that really have worked within the genre, you know, a lot. So the, 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 the making something for TV like I keep saying, is, is so different to, to if you're directing something for stage. So I think that was a really key learning to, to make sure that you, you created a team that were producers, directors, cinematographers, sound people, set designers, artistic direction, all of those, you know, it's just your, your first assistant director, your second assistant director, your runners, all of those sound, all of those people, you know, is part of your collaborative team. So it's Having it's it's understanding who would work with you really well, and building and building the team that also can work with you really well, but also can work at the level that that broadcast would expect you to work at. So so that was a that was quite a big learning curve, and I think the big again you know working with the script editor yeah was 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 something that was the lengthier part of getting ready really rethinking everything um is there anything else that you would really like to get so our, our audience today will be a mix people works and artwork in arts organizations and lots of freelance artists and writers and so on is there anything else that you would like to sort of you know thinking reflecting on the experience of um being the exec in these two films as part of the unlocked series is there anything else that you would like to share with the audience absolutely i think 
think one of the greatest things for me is that you know you can have you can put in place all the different teams and collaborations that can help you make the work that you need there's more opportunities out there now for example bbc arts and sky arts and many production companies who really specialize in in um, working with arts organizations to to you know create work for for broadcast there's that that is all there but i'd say always take it back to that beginning point why are you making this piece of work for broadcast who's going to see it and and what is the message just really say to keep, always be thinking to yourself is this relevant is this a global story you know what is the story um that i want to make am i going to get that audience so just always going back to that um because i think we can be making work that we're very used to making that's very precious to ourselves and you know have done very very well with with the people that we that we're making it for in our kind of area but it's it's always thinking about those things how can i adapt it for that audience lovely thank you so much seema i'm going to ask you to um just to turn your camera off and relax and enjoy the rest of the conversation then we'll bring you back in for the panel at the end thank you really that's great really useful um and, and I'm going to ask Rosie to join me now. Thank you. Thanks, Seema. So we'll get, hello, hello, hello. Just give me one second. Right. I'm just need to. Oh. Rosie, hello. Hello. Um, thank you very much. So we've just, we've heard a, a, a kind of a, a TV case study here. And um, so you're, you're a radio producer. And what I'll do is explain to the audience that your, your role in all of this. And um, so, so, uh, Rosie is an experienced radio producer and she, as she said in the intro works with Radio 3 and Radio 4 so um, what we're being clear about in terms of um, radio broadcasting and opportunities for arts organisations is that the BBC commissions from um, uh, acknowledged producers who are already on a list so it's not a thing where you can just apply to something mean, there's there's various other um, Sometimes there are schemes and so on, but in, in essence, if you were going to work on a, you'll get your work onto the radio, it would be via a, an existing producer, which is, and, and Rosie is somebody who has worked within the BBC and also for many years as an independent. So, so her context today is that um, she works with artists and arts organisations some of the time within the programmes that she makes. Is that, is that's a fair starting point, isn't yeah, it? Right? Yeah. Thank you. But I didn't want to confuse anybody by saying that you know that you could set up as a as a radio producer yourself and just go off and apply for a commission so so we're going to i'm going to get you to start by talking about the, the the radio commission the process of being commissioned what how does that happen for you and then we'll talk more specifically about the projects that you've worked on with the space so in, in general how do you get commissioned what happens so i think like all independent producers the radio producers i pitch ideas and what happens at the BBC is that uh, in BBC radio, which is very, very different from television, let's say that at the outside, the set, um, they have what's called offers rounds. So they will once or twice a year, they'll have an offers round and you can uh, pitch ideas at that time. And what I would say is that although, you know, people can't pitch ideas if they're not an established radio, company, anybody can actually look at those documents. They are online. Um, and actually, I, I think it's a good thing to look at. So if you tap into Google, um, we'll put the link. Radio we'll, we'll, we'll put the link into the chat. Yeah. So we can get to the to the yeah. commission pages, we can do yeah, that. Yeah, I, I, I think it's useful because you can then see the sort of things that actually the broadcasters are looking for. So at the moment, the Radio 3 offers round has just opened and there's a very detailed Brief about what they're looking for. I and mean, there may be people who are watching this that have got something that might fit in. So that's quite useful. Um, and I would say to people, uh, you know, the, the best thing that you could do is approach independent companies who are local to you or who are in your sort of area of interest. And if you don't know who the local independent radio producers are in your area, you could contact the Radio Academy and they have regional offices and they can tell you who's making what in your area. So I hope that's maybe useful to people. Yeah. Yeah. 
Um, I'm just wondering, can you come a little bit, maybe a bit closer to your screen? Because this is just to make sure we can hear you a little more clearly. Let's just check. Sure. I brought my screen close to you. Oh, yeah. that sounds better. <laughs> that clearer to everybody else if Rosie just says hello hello can we hello, just hello 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 that sound I'm looking to see if that sounds better to the to the audience if you can hear Rosie just gives oh yeah all good we've got an all good smashing thank okay. you okay so um so you you pitch ideas um and you know we're here talking about how our arts and culture gets onto radio and telly how do you, where do your ideas come from, Rosie? What, how do you find the things that you want to pitch? Yeah, that's a very good question. Um, never from reading the newspaper, I can say that. I've never got an idea from the newspaper. It's talking to people, it's reading stuff. It's, it's just keeping your antenna open all the time, I think, to what's a good story. And that's what they're interested in. Um, I, maybe I'll say something concrete about that, but what they're interested in is strong stories. Sina said that. Um, but for example, maybe well, here's an example from my point of view. Um, I, uh, I'm interested in near death experience, for example. If I go to Radio 4 and say, let's have a you know, program about near death experience, it's too general. I actually came across a story about two men who'd had near-death experiences at the same time and seem to be in contact with each other. That's gold dust for radio. You know, it's very specific, it's very vibrant. Um, and that's, that's what they're looking for. They're looking for a story that they haven't heard before or access to, you know, material or, you know, communities that they haven't heard from. That that will float their boat. Mm -hmm. So, and, and uh, as you said earlier, you know, you saying if, if you're an arts organisation or an artist, and you're interested in this, you'd be wanting to contact indies and it would be about, you know, so maybe people, your, your, your antenna is always up and I guess and, and other producers are like minded. So there's a, yes, we're hungry all the time, hungry for ideas. Yeah, and we love collaborating with people and we love collaborating very creatively with people. Um, we're not necessarily interested in somebody saying I've got a fully formed project and I just want to put it on the radio through your company um we like to be involved you know and we, we you know we like to do the radio-ness of that so, radio yeah. Yeah. <laughs> lovely thank you um and so we were going to talk a bit a bit more detail about some quite specific content that you've made for the the West Midlands broadcast development program that was a co-commissioned co work between Radio 3 and, and The Space. Um, and you've made um, a range of programmes under that, uh, in as part of that. But the one that we wanted to talk about is, is Metal City, um, where you worked with the poet Gregory Ledbetter and musicians and artists and writers and all kinds of people. And you said to me that this is probably one of your most creative projects. So I thought that we would we will play the first 40 odd seconds of it so people get a feeling for what it is. And then I'll ask you about the process of making it, how you collaborated with the artists and how it all how it kind of came together. So can, um, are we able to play that first clip? Metal City. How has metalworking in Birmingham affected its culture over hundreds of years? Listen. Sound travels from the heart of a star to the beating metal heart of a city born in light and fire. Sparks that catch on the tongue and bring the glister and torch of song from the cold seed of a sun sown in the earth. Star stuff grown like a soul waiting to be found, smelted from this singing ground that glows again at the blast of flame. Thank you. So that's just the start of it. We put the link into the full program because it's available still. Um, so I just wanted to, the question is really about the making of it and the collaborating with the creatives. How, what, what are your sort of key thoughts about that? Can I just say something about the commissioner? Something 
that was one of the questions was what's the process with the commissioner it's very different from television we agreed what this program was with the commissioner and the next time we heard from him was when it went out on air and what he thought of it so that's basically once the commission is set you're off and they trust you to get on with it and um, even i think even people who aren't necessarily huge experience that would be how it works so it's very free in that sense which is great and exciting so you don't have this feeling that people are looking looking over your shoulder all the time um so the process was once we'd agreed on the idea which is to find out how metal working fed into the culture of the city particularly into the music heading towards the birth of heavy metal. Um, so then I was looking, well, I knew that I would want a particular poet, Gregory Ledbetter, fantastic poet. I knew he was a fantastically safe pair of hands. Then I needed to go and look for um, a sound designer. So I went to the conservatoire and asked them to recommend somebody. Um, and I have very good uh, relationships with them so I trusted them implicitly that they would give me the right person and um, the, the choir I already knew this is a folk choir based in the Midlands so it was a matter of talking to people about what this project was going to be and then we started to feel our way into it we had no idea what it was going to be at the beginning when I started to think about this talking about this last night I thought oh it's incredibly risky because we had no idea if it would work. It's not like telly where you said, I'm going to do X, Y, and Z. It's an idea that will evolve. And I find that really exciting. Um, so we saw, I started by making some interviews with local historians. I sent them to the poet. Um, we talked a lot about how he would work. Um, he was going to divide the story into different chapters. So we let him get on with that. And then um, once he'd started writing the chapters, he sent them to the sound designer. And then we talked a lot with the sound designer about how to set each chapter sonically so that there was a variety, there was a build within 45 minutes that we would hold people's attention, um, that the sound was appropriate to the poetry. Um, and then we started to add the music into that, talking with the choir about, you know, writing a new song for this uh, production. We got them into studio and we um, recorded their, their music. Then we got readers to read bits. And then it's a matter of feeding all of that into my little laptop here and then just sitting with it and editing and editing and editing. <laughs> and then eventually, goes into a big studio to get fine mixed. To get, what was the final mix? Fine mix, yeah, so really polish it up. So, um, you know, you're looking at every single sound at that point, every single um, word, because <laughs> you've got to edit to, you know, the second third. Um, if it, what, how do you think the experience was? I mean, I'm not, I'm sort of, I'm wondering whether people the artists and the creatives that you work with, whether they, they gave you any feedback on the process for them or any, and you had any feeling about how they felt about it, what was good, what worked? I think we all loved it. It was very collaborative. Everybody got on, it was great. We had a great big party at the end and we listened to the programme and go out as a party. Um, and yeah, it was just fantastically um, interesting to sort of see this, Thing, this idea become actually a piece of radio. Um, yeah, I think everybody really loved the, the, the experience of working on something together. It's wonderful to make something that is together because it's so much more than you can do on your own, isn't it? I, I think this is coming through really, uh, uh, perhaps you could say it's a of all, all kind of art and creative endeavor, you know, the, the collaborations and the sparking of ideas is is the key thing so you kind of that that fits across all all the work that we do um and and um so so do you all of those people so you you've talked about we've talked about the poets and we talked about um 
musicians. Was there were there other people involved in this in this project as well? Uh, well, there were interviewees, there were readers. I had another producer alongside me, fantastic producer, um, sound engineers. Yeah, I, when we actually assembled everybody for this party, there were about fifty people. Yeah, um, yeah, amazing. Yeah, and you also oh you also worked on um t two other sorts of short series. So that's that's another thing that you do is the the um where you work with a, a writer. So there was Black Country Secrets and Coming Home, both of which are also available. And they um they are much more sort of straightforward structure, weren't they, in terms of the, the programs that you make? But again, you're building a relationship with a writer or an artist to do that. Is there anything else that you would say about those, the processes of making either of those series, which again, we'll put the links into the chat so people can have a listen to them. Well, they were two series of essays for Radio 3. Radio 3 has the essay series late at night. And so we, we wanted to highlight um, and encourage uh, writers from Birmingham and then from the Black Country. The Black Country writers particularly aren't um, well represented. And so they wrote um, 15 minute essays. Um, so I worked with Writing West Midlands, who are a fantastic organisation, to find the writers, make links with them. Um, and then they wrote their essays. And actually from that, we made great links with local writers. And I'd like to now take those on and find other projects. So it's very fruitful, I think, for everybody. And again, all about having your antennae and being aware and being yeah. making connections yeah. with people and people making connections with you and so yes, on. That's great. Yeah. Brilliant. Thank you. So um, again, if there are any particular questions that anybody would like to ask of Rosie, they can go into the um, they can go into the chat. Let's see. So we've somebody saying, um, oh yeah. So Rosie and Natalie seem to have different experiences. That's right. So Natalie was talking about the a broadcaster as a TV broadcaster who wants to have input at all stages. Rosie's saying that the commissioner won't hear the program until it's made, but that's the di that's a difference in this situation between radio and TV, isn't it? Exactly. Yeah, it's a much more flexible animal is um, radio. Yeah. Uh, and anyway, you can hear the spontaneity of that. So they do. They, they don't come back to you and say anything about. Is that? I mean, obviously, there's an element of trust in there, and I suppose that's the other thing to talk about is to say that the commissioning process. It's the BBC commissioning guidance is very clear that they, when they you're commissioning through the rounds, they're they're commissioning from um, producers who are already in in the system and have been accredited. So it's not they're not taking work from people they don't know, are they? On the, the whole, not. I mean, I think if somebody approached them with something absolutely amazing. They probably try and match them up with somebody to help get that on air. Um, but on the whole, they want to know that once it's commissioned, they can let it be made and people can get on with it. And you can always go back. Sometimes I feel like I want some input from the commissioner, mm -hmm. and I'll you know send him or it's usually at him at the moment, um, them something and say, you know. What do you think of this? I, I want to get it right for you. It's not, I'm not making this for me. Yeah. I'm making this for the audience. Is this right? You know the audience best than I do. So, you know, is this clear? Is this the tone, etc.? Okay. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, and so there was just um, I was just picking up on so the we were asked questions in advance about you know the opportunities in radio and so on. And but you're very you know. Rosie, you work with the BBC, don't you, with Radio 3, 4 and the World Service. And oh, we've got our geeky question saying, what do you use to edit? I use something called Sadie, which is uh, a, quite an old fashioned editing system that the BBC introduced. It's very old fashioned. I think it's brilliant. People keep trying to persuade me to use something else. <laughs> I haven't seen anything better at the moment. You can also use Ableton, I think. That lots uh, and reaper people are using um and in fact we mix the program on ableton but for me at my sort of level which isn't huge i'm not involved with huge uh, streams of audio sadie is what i use okay thank you um 
so we'll put we've got another couple of links into the commit to things about commissioning and also to um radio production resources so we'll put all of those into chat and there might be some ideas in there that are helpful to people as well yeah. um, we're going to stop there thank you rosie and we're going to take a short break for five minutes before we hear from helen and from sarah um and i think we have one of the things i've seen you know we, we can't cover everything in this and, and pitching is one of the things that we've had questions about but it's not for this uh for this session so um we put put out our pitch perfect documentation sort of a, a kind of crib sheet on how you might pitch and i think we're going to uh, ask in the in the five minute break if you have a chance to have a look at it um, we're trying to understand how helpful and useful that might be. So if you get a chance to look at the document and if you have a chance to fill in our poll, which I think is going to appear, we would really appreciate it. And other than that, we'll be back at 11.56 to, to hear about Peaky Blinders. Thank you. enjoyed your break i don't think we did the poll so maybe for next time so we're now going to um hear from from helen shoot and sarah butcher about the making of the um the a version of a filmed version of the peaky blinders ron bear dance that's go, um, has been announced it's going, going to go out on but BBC Four and also there'll be cinema release. So all very exciting. It's the, the film version of this, the fantastic ballet that Bomba have done. So Helen and Sarah, can you, are you able to join? Hello, hello. To wait for Sarah to appear. Hello, thank you. Thank you for coming back. Right, so let's just get straight, straight into this. So I'm gonna start with you, Helen, obviously. Um, so thinking about, can you just talk us through how the idea for a broadcast version of Piggy Blinders came about? and how the project evolved. Yes, um, and, it, and it wasn't as straightforward as it, it might seem because now I look back on it, it was really, really obvious. This is how we should, we should have made it. But um, the, the journey from, from talking to the, the BBC in the space for the first time to, to getting the, the show shot and, and, and delivered, um, went through probably about three iterations. The first was, um, and I think it's quite an important one for, for arts organisations thinking about working with, with broadcast channels. The first was actually, I pitched a completely different idea um, to, to the BBC, um, probably about, two, about a year before coming out of COVID. We'd, um, Ron Bear had been making quite a lot of um, work for camera and we'd been broadcasting it live. And, and my initial pitch was around a couple of a couple of the commissioners from the BBC had seen that and had really liked it. So I used that as a way in. And I and my my opening gambit was should we should we think about doing doing one of those together? And there was some interest, but it immediately threw up loads of questions around risk and what happens if you know someone gets on injured mid-show and all the sorts of things we hadn't worried about as much when we were doing it on our own channel. Um, but I think that something that's quite important to remember is that broadcasters um, are used to working with production companies who have slates of productions and they have things at different stages of development. And so once you're in a conversation, being willing to talk about all of your content, I think, is always a really, really good first step when you're when you're trying to get your work on television. And, and through the conversations I was having with them, um, it seemed natural to mention that we were also optioning. Um, Peaky Blinders to make a, a stage show. It had not occurred to me that we would try to put Peaky Blinders on television because we were taking it from television and putting it on stage. And um, and I hadn't got to the point where I was even considering sort of cycling back to putting it on, on screen. And we certainly didn't have the rights to do it at, at that stage. But I, I mentioned it as a sort of, and these are the other kinds of things that, that Ron Bear does. Um, and there was an immediate glint in the eye from, from the BBC Arts team. 
Um, we then went away and made the stage show, um, but I had by that stage dropped into the mix with all the relevant rights holders and creatives that, that I wondered if maybe there could be some kind of filmic outcome. And um, initially the, the idea was that we would, that we would rather than capturing the stage show, we would consider making a dance film version. So sort of rethinking the product. Um, we did pitch doing it live um, because we didn't want to let go of that idea. Um, we then moved to the idea of making a feature film more or less on location. Um, and, and actually, I think that was just in the run up to the premiere. And then, then a lot of the, the BBC team came to the premiere in Birmingham. And at that point, we're saying to us, but this is brilliant. We should be putting this on television. Um, and so I sat down with our, our artistic director, who's also the creator of our show, and asked him how he would feel about a capture, which he'd been initially quite hesitant about. Um, and he was still quite hesitant because he was worried that um, it just wouldn't be better than people seeing it in the theatre. He's like, I want to do it, but it, there should be a reason why it's on television and not just you haven't been to the theatre so you can watch it on, on television. For him, it, it needed to be an artistic reason that, that it should be on television. And so I went back to, it was Emma Cusack, who was our um, commissioning editor at the BBC at the time, and, and sort of said, look, I'm not, I'm not sure it's, it's right for us. Is there any way we could talk about doing it in a different way? And at that point, and I think it's really, um, this idea of work, really working closely with the commissioners, it's really important to listen to what they, they, they want to do. And I sort of said, we don't need a production company. Ron Barry is a production company. We, we know what we want to do. And, and she said, look, I really think you do need a production company, but I really hear that what you're saying is that you don't want someone to just come in and film your show. You want to own the creative process and, and, and be part, you know, be partners in that. Um, and she said, I really, really want you to meet Sarah and Matt from North South. And, and actually that was probably the Tuesday was the premiere. So I spoke to her on the Wednesday and by Friday, Sarah and Matt were in Birmingham watching, watching the stage show and, and, and met with Benoit after that to, to talk about what they think they thought would be achievable that might be out of the ordinary yet somehow give, give audiences at home and an opportunity to feel the stage show but sort of actually getting that visceral experience which we were worried we would lose um so Sarah I don't know if you want to pick up at, at that point or do you want to have another question sorry Linda I, I'm enjoying listening to this and thinking it you're sort of really echoing this whole idea of the sort of the diff, different people coming together makes all of this happen so yeah just Sarah you're thinking how how you get involved what you saw your role in it in all of this as at that point yeah so we um very from very early on we understood what Ron Bear wanted from this stage show going on screen which which was that it had to fit the world of Peaky Blinders but also not be just a more traditional stage capture and North South exists to translate stage to screen in a really exciting way for screen audiences so that the experience isn't that they are missing out on being in the seat in the theatre but to think about screen storytelling and to bring that to the show um, and it was really clear really on that we were really aligned in that vision and wanting to do that um, and Natalie mentioned at the beginning about what a sort of what a production company comes on board potentially to do and I think it it's um, it's interesting to hear you say, Helen, that you know you were thinking, oh, you know, Rum Rumba can do this, and I think one Maybe of the just interesting things. Spoiler, but I was completely wrong, by the way. Ron Beck couldn't have done this, <laughs> but, but, but yeah, that is where I started from. <laughs> but I think we came we came on board and we understood what the challenges might be, and it was collaborative from the get go. And I think that's the really it is the really important thing because we understood the um, creative drive for Ron Bear wanting to do this, um, the vision that Benoit had held about the um, original 
plan of kind of taking it onto location and understanding what it means for a creative person to have a vision for something and then have to retract from that. There's sensitivities there around going, okay, but how can this still deliver um, something really exciting that, that meets somewhere in the middle of that, but is also something that is a translation in its own right of the product that already exists. Um, and so we worked really closely with Rombo from the very beginning, right from sort of the scoping stage of what, what this might be and how it might look, um, and getting all of that through all of the kind of BBC's paperwork stages of um, commissioning specifications and draft budgets and bringing that together, but also having to kind of get get in there with Rombert. I was coming into the office sometimes and sitting sitting down so that I could speak to the people who were next to me, who were so underneath the show and knew the ins and outs of it and knew exactly what the challenges of putting it on screen might be. Um, right from, you know, access to dancers and making sure we were within equity rules to, you know, knowing that we needed more, you, you really have to get in amongst the team in order to kind of deliver it. Um, and, and, you know, we, we, we did that right from the get go. And I think that is almost the most important part of a sort of successful stage to screen adaptation. Thank you. Um, and talking about successful adaptations, shall we watch the clip? I'm just going to stall for a second while uh, Rita gets it lined up. But Sarah, do you want to say something about? Is there anything you want to say about the clip that we're going to show just now at the red right hand? Clip? Yeah. So this is just um, a sort of one minute-ish clip of um, the first time red right hand appears in the in the film, um, and I think it just gives a good look and feel for um, the the whole piece. Oh, brilliant. Okay. Great. It looks great. It's very exciting, isn't it? There's so much to ask about. So the thing is about, you know, sort of really thinking about the, the process of making it, you know, we're talking about the layers of people who are involved and what's at the heart of it. Just really interested in how you collaborated with each other and with the BBC and, and how, how does the decision making work? Who's, who's in charge at what different points? Well, I think um, it's also, and this is sort of an unusual example, um, and um, but I've learned so much from it that I think I would apply to any production that I worked on, but it's also worth remembering that with a title like Peaky Blinders, you've got some very serious rights holders who have a lot a lot of involvement and a lot of say over what is and isn't possible and you know our show was created with the with one of them the the writer of Peaky Blinders Stephen Knight and what was really brilliant for myself and Sarah is Steve could not have been more on board with um with first of all the stage show and then the idea of bringing it back onto screen and is obviously really experienced in working in television possibly one of the most experienced people we could have been working with um, and had and had not just input creatively but also really helpful input about how to navigate the the broadcaster when you're dealing with 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 you're dealing with such significant ip um, and making sure that that we got the right value out of the commission, which I think is really important to, to, to do your research and understand what kind of budgets the commissioner you're working with might usually spend on a production and then think about where your product might sit within their slate. Because um, initially I, I was pitching for a much higher budget, but I was way outside of the BBC Arts commissioning now we we did have a title that they they really wanted but but actually once I did my research and understood the level that they would normally commission at knowing that that was probably going to be around the top and you know pushing pushing it a little bit might work but but not much more so again I think um that was something that oh my lights have just gone off um that was something that um that I wish I had kind of done in advance rather than wasting time on a couple of rounds of pitching and, and budgets that, that weren't going to happen. And I think that when, when Sarah came on board, I'd done a good piece of work of stretching the budget as far as we could. And um, what was brilliant is, you know, all credit to the space team who, who came in and really helped get that over the line and, and, um, and made, made it a co-production. Um, but from that, from that moment, um, Sarah, Sarah putting together the budget. Actually, the, I think I've never seen so many budget lines I've never heard of. 
you know, it was, you know, you know, I would, it was, it's quite a, as a producer, you, you think, you know, you know, you know what you're doing and like going through, going through the numerous considerations that, that wouldn't have appeared in any of my, my first draft budget. So again, I can't advocate for, for working with a production company um, early enough. And in fact, I think that going forward, I would even recommend, and I can see we've got some freelance um, artists and also um, companies on, on, on the chat. I think I would probably start pitching to production companies going forward rather than go, trying to go directly to the commissioners. And actually, I don't know why I didn't realize as soon as I worked in um, television drama for a couple of years. And that's absolutely how it works is that the production companies are building their slates and then they have really great relationships with the commissioners. They tend to have more than one project at a time in the in the various different stages of making. And that was certainly true, Sarah, when we, when we, when we started working together, you'd already worked with... BBC Arts recently, you had a couple of other projects in the pipeline. So you also had a really good insight into where they were up to, where we could push for a little bit more, where we needed to back off, where we might have a bit of flexibility on timelines. Timelines are a nightmare when you're dealing with um, television because, I mean, what did we get a green light two weeks before filming, which was yeah. almost almost crippling. And, you know, we had, to, um, we had to hold our nerve to the point where if it hadn't worked, we would have looked like we were crazy. And we were really lucky that we were really lucky that it that it went ahead. And I think we both instinctively knew that it was going to happen. But that was um, that was something that I was reflecting on as just not how we're used to working as you know we, we tend to plan really far in advance we book our freelancers a year ahead we know our show schedule our dancers are on full-time contracts which helps in the sense that they were we could keep them available but put me in real financial jeopardy because they they weren't do you know they, there was a risk that they wouldn't have been doing anything um because we had we didn't put any touring production touring in during during the period that we wanted to shoot so and again that was something that it would have if you know no, because Sarah had been working closely with the commissioner and she understood their timelines and she also understood the noises that they were making. I think that between us, we sort of could come to the conclusion that there was a way that we could hold on. Whereas I think it would have been very hard for me to make that decision without that insight because I just didn't know if this is normal. So you usually have to wait this long <laughs> to, you know, get the contract. You know, what does it mean that they've just asked this question and, and kind of Sarah being able to say, well, you know, this is what happened when they didn't follow through the project. And this is what happened when they did. And I think it's, this is, you know, this is sounding to me like it is going to happen. And then the question was just, could we, could we land it on the pre very precise timing that we had available? Um, so yeah, that was something that I found that that's something that I'm still trying to navigate when we when we have these ideas for 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 television. It's always immediately the producing team at my end always say to me, "Okay, great, and when are we doing it?" And not being able to answer that question early in the process is something that I still haven't quite figured out how to how to manage. Mm. Sarah, is there anything you want to chip in there? Thoughts? Yeah, I think just around the challenges of if you're capturing something when it's on stage already, obviously there's a set time period in which you can do that. And sometimes working with broadcasters and helping them to understand that there is a whole set of, um, there's a whole workflow here that is built around when the stage show is happening. And obviously if that moment passes, then the whole project is gone because you the the budget to remount it would never come to fruition so it's almost like having to do a lot of setup work and development work in anticipation of a green light um, so that everything is in place so that when they press go um, you can just put that flow into action um, so that goes down from obviously having gone and done the big ticket things like making sure all of the licensing is in place but also having your crew and your accommodation booked and who's going to cater etc all on hold that could possibly disappear and not every green light comes two weeks before but it begs the question around capacity of arts organizations solo to be able to do that work in order to have it ready to go should everything go through um because and so the show on at the same time i think it's you know we had like and that had that was one of the things that we were managing is the company was on tour 
doing the show live at that time. So adding that extra layer of preparation was really challenging. So it sounds nerve wracking to me. It was. <laughs> There's always jeopardy. There's always <laughs> jeopardy. And I think this is the really interesting thing about this world of kind of translating stage capture, um, you know, go, creating this work from something, you know, Peaky's so interesting because it's, as Helen was saying, it's TV to stage back to TV again. Um, and the kind of the, the cycle of that and the voices that were involved in that because of the how significant the IP was, was a really interesting journey for a piece of work to take. Um, and I think somebody asked a question earlier about um, how TV sort of commissioners are quite um, obviously involved in, you know, in, in the process versus radio. And I think it all comes back to, in some ways, that commissioning specification document that you have to sort of write down at the very beginning of the project in television, where you say, this is what we're going to do and this is how we're going to do it. And navigating changes that ha might happen along the way through that document, you almost have to um, think about the kind of workflow as the the way that you communicate and the documents that you talk through the documents to the broadcaster because they will constantly be looking for what you've said and what you've delivered um and i think actually it can be a really powerful relationship it doesn't have to be a negative one because there were definitely moments where we were um where, where you know we 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 asked for things that were outside of their usual scope and they gave them to us because we presented the case and we said you know this is for example something technical like we wanted to put a slight cinescope on it on it which is a slight sort of um sort of black bars top and bottom um very small isn't standard commission delivery um, and we asked for it, we made our case and it was it was granted because we wanted to place it in the world of cinema of Peaky Blinders and give it that aesthetic, which was really important to Benoit in order for the project to make. And it was really important to us as a production company that tries to really get underneath um, the kind of the show and to really deliver it in a cinematic way and so broadcasters will work with you um but but ultimately they need to understand why and they need to be able to be pointed somewhere as to what you've said and what you're doing but i think sarah's talking to a really important point which is um i've my experience of working in in television or whether it's through my arts organization or or when i was 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 working in television is there's a lot there's a lot more rigor behind the scenes in in broadcast than I find in in my usual relationships with with venues and and art and art centers, and so this thing of like a, a, a specification of what you've been commissioned to do, and then the idea that you need to report on changes was a completely new con concept for for me. You know, I, I'm you know I've, I've been lucky enough to produce um, in in contemporary dance for for many years and quite often the the premiere of a new show is the first time that the venue director sees the work and they say oh is that what we talked about but you know there's no animosity about that it's you know there's a lot it's very artist-led there's a lot of there's you know as long as the show runs at about the same length of time and has you know the, the key features I've, I've never been asked to explain why a storyline changed or why the com composition changed you know and I think that it's, it was a very very different process even with an existing show there was so much scope to film it in different ways and to to come up with different ideas but this idea that we had been briefed to do something and I think it's worth remembering that those commissioners are often sitting in very large organizations and reporting to a lot of different people and so having them on your side by being really transparent and also working with them in the processes I think is incredibly important and I think that I think you may if you make it difficult for your commissioner it's much less likely that your project will will, will be greenlit Thank you. I'm just going to just say, flag to the audience, we've got about 10 minutes left of the webinar. So just if there's any particular questions um, that you, the, uh, the audience want to ask of you, then to, to stick them in now. And then I'm just going to ask you while that's going on, how do you feel about the out? How, how do you feel about the, the show that you've created for broadcast? H Helen and Sarah, what, how do you feel about the piece? What you, what you, 
I'm I'm delighted by it and I think that what's interesting for me because I'm really the you know I'm I'm the producer of the stage show and then you know I have the honor of being credited as the exec producer of the of the the film and um I think that I had to go through a sort of bit of separation anxiety because I've made a stage show that I've lived with and I love and I and I'm still promoting and so my you know so I had to go through and and Sarah will know this from my notes my notes all started out as when you're in the theater you really see this so when you're in the theater you really feel that and so, and so I think that I had to sort of do a bit of letting go during the notes process to get to the final edit. But then when we were sitting in the cinema um, watching the, the, the sign off edit with, with Steve, with Benoit, you know, the, the, with the key creative team, the underlying rights holders, there was a lot of pressure going in to watch it because you were just thinking there's so many people here who could, who could um, have um, have take issue with some elements of it, and we'll be back to this back to square one. Um, but actually, I forgot about that almost the second that it started, and I watched a film that I hadn't seen before, and um, and it is different, and it it feels different. I think the, the the key elements have been captured brilliantly, but it doesn't it, for me. It is a separate standalone artwork, and I really love that. And I and so yeah, I'm I'm now extremely excited um about sharing it sharing it with the public so that's that's my take on the journey thank you and and Sarah how do you feel about it yeah we are so proud of the collaboration and how um, and the results I think um it was really key for us that very early on everyone got on board with the fact that we were telling this story for a screen audience which means if you are seeing something in a close, you aren't seeing everything else. And so to move away from that theatre audience kind of wide picture and have to retell that story through, you know, screen literacy and the way you tell stories on screen, to be allowed to do that and to get in there with the story was um, fantastic for us and, you know, really resulted in something that um, we think is quite special. Fab, thank you very much. OK, I'm just going to quickly look at the questions here. Somebody's saying, how does the funding setup work between an arts company slash production company and commissioner? I don't know if you are willing to say something specific about your. Sure, uh, I don't think. I think we um, we um, received funding from three three sources essentially um, to make the film. That's the space, BBC Arts, and um, the film tax credit. Are the three are the three areas that are supporting the film, um, and that those those three elements together support the additional cost of making Peaky Blinders into a film so so Ron Best's contribution is the the show that it that exists you know we we've we've produced it we've made it and so our, our commission for capture didn't include any anything that was was in the original stage production um, Ron Bear obviously also in in addition had to then think about the the cost of the dancers for the for the time during the filming and um, I think at one point we hoped we might cover their entire salaries for the week but what what we definitely were able to include in the film production budget were the additional extras like the additional equity payments overtime payments crew payments that that, that we needed to make um, so that was how that those were our income streams um, in this case our our budget provided the um the costs to have north south involved as production company i think it'd be fair to say that that sarah took a punt on us <laughs> and, and did a huge amount of work to get to get us greenlit which um you know you you need to find a production company that believes in the in the show sufficiently in in order to do that um and then and then um so that so that piece of that piece was covered by the production budget and um and then we we you know we have to share we have to share any further income depending on on what we do with it with with a selection of creatives and 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 rights holders so Ron, Ron does own the film but um but we own it with with a significant obligation to to the people who allowed us to make it and helped us make it to to share any further income but so that was that was the setup that that, that we operated on great thank you um I'm just I'm noticing that we've got lots of questions about pitching and finding a production company, which we don't have time to go into in detail here. But um, I just put the details in all, all our documents about how to pitch and some advice on where you might go to find production. Could I, companies. Could I just make a really quick suggestion? Which is obviously, I heard about Sarah and Matt from Emma. But what um, what I would have done if I if I didn't know if I now now I know you need a production company is anything that you like 
look who the produ the production company will be named in the credits and just and that that would be where I would start from you know if I was now starting although I've got Sarah so I don't need to <laughs> but, um I, oh everything's going to them but if I if I um if I needed to anything I liked I would be reaching out to the production company and saying I loved what you did with this and I've got something that I think you might like can we have a coffee would that work Sarah? Yeah, definitely. I think just looking at things that you like and then I think approaching production companies um, who do often have those quick ins with broadcasters um, to be able to say, you know, there's this idea, this idea, and then pick things up and work and work collaboratively, collaboratively with you through it is a really good approach. Uh, OK, thank you. I'm really mindful of the time. So what we're going to do now is we um, we'll, we'll just stop for a minute. Um, the, a link will come through in the chat to our evaluation because obviously with all of the webinars we really the, the evaluation that you give us helps us to understand what's working really well and um, what we can do differently um, and then we'll have to, a couple of minutes I think we might run over by a couple of minutes I hope that's okay to give our speakers all of our speakers a chance to say just if if, if, if I mean asking the speakers um, for a, a final thought or word of advice or a reflection for anyone who's got their, set their sights on a broadcast opportunity. So just speakers, just have a think, is there one last thing you would like to share with the audience before we finish up? I'll, I'll call you all back in in a minute. Thank you. Yeah, so can I invite Seema and Rosie and Sarah and Helen and Natalie back and then we'll just have a quick round up and see um, if there's if there's one last piece of advice that you would want to give or a thought that you'd want to share with the audience from your own experience. I'll go back to you Seema, what, what would your thought be to everybody? My thoughts are that we are living in a digital age now and um, if you do want to venture into creating a digital interpretation of whatever arts piece you're doing, think about it from the beginning. Don't think about it at the end. <clears throat> because just as Sarah and, um, sorry, I've forgotten her name. Helen. Helen has spoken about the differences between stage to screen are huge. It's the same with dance and all art forms. So. Think about it from the beginning. How can you be telling your story in a different way? Um, but as you're writing, you know, as you get into the point of getting your, you know, getting your crew, everybody together for that particular piece of artwork, but you also be thinking about digital because I think digital, there's so many things going on right now. Keep your finger on the pulse of so what's happening within digital, who's watching what and where, and start thinking about how you can start to translate your piece of work for those platforms. Thank you. Thanks so much, Seema. Um, Rosie, what would your piece of advice or your reflection be? I think uh, what Helen and Sarah have just said about approaching production companies directly is absolutely right. You know, in terms of radio, listen to radio. If there's material that you really love and you think that's the sort of tone, that's the sort of approach that I love, that's, you know, they may be the people to approach. And uh, radio producers love to be talked with, so don't be shy, hold, don't hold back. And, um, you know, I think this thing, that it's about strong storytelling, strong storytelling. It's about telling a story that hasn't been told or in a way that hasn't been told. Um, that is always exciting. And in radio, 
as I sort of um, understand it, it's a very, very much more organic process. You, you're making this thing together from the bottom up. And if you're up for that, then find a good production company and pitch your way. Thank you very much. Sarah, do you, if, if you've got any final thoughts? Um, yeah, I was just going to say it's okay not to know, um, because if you're embarking on this for the first time, then you can't be expected to know how it all works. And there are people out there who do. And what's interesting is even when you're working with the people who know what they're doing, they'll come up against something where they need to bring somebody else in, another expert on another element. And so I think it's really important to um just not feel like you need to know at the very offset of a project but just to to go for it and find the people that you need along the way thank you very much and helen any last thoughts from you um obviously it doesn't help if we all reiterate the same point but i think that for me that i always used to think about um the commissioners and the broadcasters being the equivalent of the theatres because that was where the audience met the work and so that and and so i always focus my attention on those few broadcasters but i think that actually it's accepting the 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 television particularly by television cinema it all works in a very very different way to to the theater to theater and touring and actually as we said finding those production company partners finding finding the people who are working in that field and building your projects with them is definitely the way i would go forward and actually you know i'm now starting conversations earlier with um, i'm just sarah and i are going to talk tomorrow about something which is at the very beginning of its journey and actually just starting with that conversation feels like a much more a much more positive route lovely thank you natalie was there anything that you wanted to add in well, I'm just, I mean, I think there's been lots of great advice um, this morning, but I think one of the things that I think it was demonstrated by Sarah and Helen's conversation is, is really you want to find and work with people who are excited about, as excited about the project as you are, um, which is demonstrated by Helen and Sarah's relationship, who get your creative ambitions, can add to them and help translate them for broadcast because there is that translation process that we've heard so much about what you know and part of that is what everyone said watch and listen to things try something out yourself you know stick an iphone camera on something and realize like oh actually it doesn't look the same We're like you know have a have a play and have a watch and listen and see whose work really chimes with you because you're wanting that chemistry and um, with it, whoever your collaborators are to make something that you're both really proud of Thank you. Thank you all. I think that the themes are really consistent and strong, aren't they? That we're sort of everybody's echoing, regardless of the scale or the, the platform. Um, so just a final word for me to say thank you very much. There's, I know there's lots of questions about kind of uh, that, that we ha haven't got to and things like rights. We've all, all the documentation we put into the links in, in the, the chat. We've got another webinar next week on Tuesday morning. We're looking at digital accessibility from a kind of strategic point of view. What, how can arts organisations and the sector widely become much more effective uh, and accessible? So we'll put a link in the in the chat to that, just a bit of a plug for next week. And other than that, thank you so much to all of our panellists for sharing their experience and their reflections so marvellously, and also to the audience for, um, for joining us today. And uh, thank you very much and enjoy the rest of your day. Bye. Thank you. You all, that was great. Thank you. See you later. Thanks. Bye. Bye. Bye.